So in, here in Bristol, we're interested in uh, processing quantum information using photons and building quantum technology. <laughs> and um, one good way to do that is to use a dual rail qubit. So you have two spatial modes, and your qubit is an illogical zero if a photon is contained in the top mode, and a logical one if it's contained in the bottom mode. And uh, by implementing three phase shifters and two beam splitters, you can get from uh, anywhere on the block sphere to anywhere else. <coughs> Um, of course, to do most quantum information protocols, you require more than one qubit. And um, uh, broadly, the most popular way to represent states of more than, more than just a handful of qubits are, are graph states, which are very important for um, a plethora of quantum information applications. Um, I'll talk a bit more about graph states for, in a moment. But for example, lattice graph states such as this one, uh, by, measure, by doing strictly local measurements on them, you can implement things like uh, um, measurement-based quantum computation, universal quantum computation. And um, there are schemes to do this using uh, photonics, using just a few uh, futuristic components like three-photon GHZ generators or low-loss delay lines, um, which is the kind of thrust and direction of this talk. Um, so a bit more about graph states. Uh, graph states are n qubit. Uh, an n qubit graph state uh, corresponds to an n vertex graph um, where you initialize those n qubits to the plus state and uh, do controlled Z operations corresponding to the edges on that graph. Uh, graph states are stabilizer states, which means they have, uh, well, for an n qubit graph state, they have n stabilizer generators, which uh, roughly follow the adjacency matrix, matrix of the graph. Um, stabili stabilizers are defined as a, an operation on a state which leaves the state untouched. Uh, and so by multiplying stabilizers, you can generate more stabilizers. Um, <coughs> and from these generators, you can generate a set of two to the n um, further stabilizers. So from those generators, n generators, you get two to the n stabilizers. Um, it turns out that you can decompose any stabilizer state into those um, into its stabilizers, and we're going to use this to measure the fidelity. So the average of the expectation value of a, of a graph state's fidelity is its uh, sorry of, uh, the average of the expectation value of graph state stabilizers is its fidelity. Uh, which we're going to use later on. Another um, important property about graph states um, is that um, many graph states, despite having obviously different constructions using these non-local CZ gates, are actually locally equivalent. Uh, and the way that you can tell that two graphs are locally equivalent is by applying this graph operation called local complementation. And if you can successfully apply that operation and get from one graph to another, then those two graphs are locally equivalent. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, the operation on, so lo to local cu complement qubit A, you take that qubit's neighborhood, which is highlighted in yellow, so the things it's connected to, and then you remove edges where they're present and add them where they're not to get the result. This has a local unitary um, operation that corresponds to it that you can do in the, on your quantum state. Um, so this gives us classes of locally equivalent states and so defines uh, classes of entanglement of graph states. Um, and there are many of these classes. So here are all of the six qubit graph states um, delineated into their uh, 11 entanglement classes. And each of these uh, types of entanglement has different properties and is useful for different things. For example, this bottom one is a kind of famous error correcting code, uh, or you have things like the lattice states I showed you earlier, and they all have slightly different applications and different things you can do with them. And so, uh, yeah, generating a, a wide variety of these things is, is useful. Um, in photonics, people have generated some of these states. Um, so we've heard yesterday about the 12-photon entanglement generated by Zhang Pan's group. Uh, they generate a, a kind of graph state. They generate a GHZ state, which is equivalent to a kind of star-like graph state here, uh, except with 12 qubits here. And the only other two graph states that have been generated in photonics are the 4-qubit cluster state, which is famously used to implement um, uh, measurement-based computing or one-way computing for the first time, and this kind of H-shaped six-qubit state. Um, <coughs> so yeah, photonics has an access to a very small portion of these. And um, there was 11 classes of six-photon graph state entanglement, but in 12 photons, um, there are 1.2 million types of entanglement of which photonics has accessed one so far. Um, um, at the moment, there's a big kind of thrust in the photonics community to uh, move to integrated platforms. We know that if we want to have more than just a handful of qubits, uh, we need to scale things down onto a platform uh, where we can have 
millions of thousands or, or millions of components. Um, in Bristol, we've pioneered the silicon photonic route, uh, uh, processing quantum information. Um, silicon photonics is a mature platform where you can build arbitrary interferometers. There are various filtering options. Um, people are working on integrating single photon detectors, and um, one day we can, well, in the classical world, uh, there are already chips showing um, uh, uh, control, electronic control logic alongside um, photonic integration. So um, <coughs> it's really showing a, a lot of promise for, for future and scaling things up. Um, so far, um, uh, silicon quantum photonics has come a long way in the last um, five years since it was since the first uh, results um, from the group here at Bristol. Um, so we've gone from interfering two force sources of, of photon pairs uh, through to having two photons in huge numbers of modes. Um, <coughs> but the one thing that all of these experiments have in common, even though this thing has thousands of components, um, is that they're all still two photon experiments. And so to uh, progress, we're going to have to change that and start to um, have increasing numbers of photons on our, on our platform. And uh, that's kind of the bust of this talk, really. Um, so how do we generate those photons to begin with? We use um, spontaneous four-wave mixing, which is from the third order nonlinearity of silicon. Um, uh, essentially, you take uh, coherently convert pump photons from a bright uh, pump beam into uh, energy converting signal and idler bands. Uh, these photons come in pairs, and if you want to wait for n of them, then you have to wait for a probability p to the n, and this is the exponentially poor scaling, which is currently limiting us to, to 12 photons at a time. Uh, and in uh, silicon chips, there are two structures that people are used to do this. One is just a long uh, waveguide, which is just a long length of crystal for this interaction to happen. And the other one is a ring resonator, which we've heard a bit about at this conference, uh, which um, increases the field strength for this interaction. Okay, yeah, and uh, these, so I've drawn these as kind of uh, pairs of photons, like an entangled graph state. We can, entangle, we can engineer these sources for these uh, pairs of photons to come out in, entangled. So in bulk optics, you would pump a crystal twice in different places or in different polarizations. And then uh, what you then have to do is erase the, the information as to which pair was generated where. So this is done with these beam displaces. Or in integrated photonics, we would pump two sources, uh, split the photons up by frequency, and then erase the information as to whether the pair was generated here or here by subsequent beam splitters to get uh, this kind of bell state here. OK. Uh, so. Once we've generated some bell pairs, we then need to entangle them. Um, and there are two popular ways of doing this in um, um, uh, linear optics. Um, at this stage, we kind of necessarily have to use post-selection. Um, and there are two post-selected entangling aids. One is the post-selected controlled Z operation, which has success probability 1 ninth. And the other one is the post-selected fusion, uh, which has success probability 1 half. Uh, these have... Uh, um, a clear um, action in the graph state picture. The controlled Z adds an edge, as per the definition of a graph state. And the fusion, uh, as the name suggests, fuses the two qubits and uh, in the post-selected variant leaves a kind of dangling qubit along the end. So what can we do to minimally combine these elements? I've described. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Um, ah, yes, yeah, so we noticed that um, these gates can be implemented quite simply with a uh, just by expanding them a little bit. So using these phase shifters, you can implement either a beam splitter or a swap or an identity. And then local operations can be used to do things like the, um, parts of the other parts of the fusion and also local complementation. So this reconfigurable post-selected entangling gate can kind of do everything that you want for graph state preparation uh, in a post-selected way. Um, <coughs> OK, so minimally combining these elements that I've introduced, um, it turns out that there are just um, yeah. Okay, yeah. So to minimally combine these elements, um, if we take two bell pairs and do a fusion on them, we get this uh, graph state, which is locally equivalent to a GHZ, and also the fully connected graph state. Uh, and if we do a controlled Z operation on these pairs, we get a linear cluster state, which is locally equivalent to the rest of the four photon graph states. And so using a reconfigurable version of this gate, we can make all of the four qubit graph states with the same chip. Yeah, this is, there are only two types of entanglement in four qubits, and they're both accessible using this, this gate, it turns out, um, which is very convenient. So um, 
uh, we put this together into a silicon chip. And um, here it is. We have two of these Bell state generators I introduced, except we take the signal photons to the top and the idler photons to the bottom. Um, and then we uh, entangle those two uh, signal photons in our reconfigurable post-selected entangling gate. And we can either do a fusion to generate the star state or GHZ type entanglement, or we can do a control Z to generate a uh, cluster state type entanglement. Uh, local operations then rotate you, it can rotate into one of the other graph states or implement um, projective measurements or any other local met, um, operation that you desire. Uh, the photons can then be, are then going to be detected, taken off chip and detected. Um, so here's what it looks like in silicon. You can see the yellow metal tracking and if you squint you can probably just about see the waveguides underneath and some heaters. Um, the experimental setup for, for this thing is quite simple. We have a uh, one optical degree of freedom, which is uh, aligning a V-groove array onto the grating couplers of the chip, vertical grating couplers. Uh, we then take a pulse laser, filter it, put it on the chip. The chip does what it does, and then we take the photons off the chip, uh, isolate the signal and idler bands with some more off-chip filters, and detect them in single photon detectors. Uh, we can control the 23 phase shifters of the device using some analog electronics from control systems. Um, <coughs> so now that we've got the chip and we're on a, we've got it on a setup, the first thing we need to do is calibrate our phase shifters because uh, integrated optics is phase stable, but it's not that phase stable. You still have to take away that offset and calibrate your uh, voltage inputs for a phase. So we enclose each of these phase shifters in, an, in a max zender and uh, do a simple interference me measurement with uh, a different amount of implied voltage. We then uh, we know how much power we're dissipating on the chip from the IV curves of our um, different phase shifters, and then we can invert that relationship to dial in any phase we like. Now that we've done that, we can start doing some single photon measurements. So the first thing we do is simply measure the brightness of the two of our four on-chip sources of spontaneous four-wave mixing. Uh, and we find that there's a kind of quadratic relationship with the power, which indicates it's this uh, third-order process. Uh, and we also find that there's a good balance between the two uh, pairs of sources that, con that constitute the uh, Bell state generators, which is good, important for their fidelity. We also measure um, the purity of these sources using an unheralded G2 method and find them to be between 0.8 and 0.9, which is quite promising. Um, we then do a tomographic set of measurements on our Bell state generators and find them to be high fidelity, so 0.97, um, which indicates that our calibration is good and things are kind of behaving as 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 we expect, uh, still 3% off uh, one, but yeah, doing well. We, and then we do some bell tests uh, using our, our sources of entanglement and comf confidently violate local realism. Um, so um, we also, so we, we got some uh, good indications that our calibration is good, but we did notice some uh, crosstalk inherent on the chip. And um, we noticed that the more heaters we turned on, the more phase uh, offset we would see for a, for a given fringe. So if I repeat a, uh, an, a bright light fringe on one of my max zenders while sequentially turning on the other phase shifters on the device that have nothing to do with that interferometer, I see that the um, phase of this interference fringe shifts slightly with the bulk heating of the device. So when we find we have a bit of crosstalk at 0 0.003 rads per milliwatt bulk dumped onto the chip. If I then uh, look at my measurement settings and see the expected power dissipated, I can come up with a kind of average phase error for my uh, measurements of my four photon states. So for my uh, star graph state that I want to measure, I find that um, my average phase offset is going to be around uh, 0.1 radian, and similarly for the line state as I measure it. Um, we'll corroborate this later on. Um, so we then move on to some four photon experiments. The first thing we do is we want to um, establish the purity or indistinguishability of our photons, and we do a, a heralded Hong mantle interference experiment where we take two pairs generated in two source, uh, sources and integrate and interfere the uh, signal photons on a max zender. Um, and as per Hong mandel interference, indistinguishable photons bunch at the output of a beam splitter. Um, so yeah, there's a subtle difference. We're using a max zender rather than a beam splitter. So in a standard um, Hongi Mandel interference experiment, um, we put two photons on a beam splitter and we get a, a HOM dip when the photons are uh, indistinguishable or maximally indistinguishable. And the depth of the dip tells us the purity. Um, but otherwise, the photons are 
probabilistically scatter and we get uh, coincidences half the time. In a fringe experiment, at the uh, pi on two and three pi on two points of the, of the phase, we have the equivalent of being in the middle of the dip. And so we see this home interference down to the level of our uh, purity or indistinguishability. But at the other point, the high points of the fringe, we see coincidences all the time. And so there's a simple relationship between these measurements to establish the purity based on the, uh, which is a property easy to extract from the home dip from our home fringe. So we do so and we measure this fringe and we get a visibility of uh, uh, about 0.8 or a home equivalent visibility. So this uh, corresponds to the uh, lower bound on the purity or indistinguishability of our uh, photons, photon pairs on the chip. Um, we now move on to measuring the, the graph states now that we know things are working as we hope they would. So again, this is a stabilizer method. The ex average expectation value of these stabilizers gives us the uh, fidelity. So first of all, the star state. Um, we measure these stabilizers, and we find a fidelity of, of 0.78. Um, and then we dial up our line state measurements, and we do the same, and we find a fidelity of uh, 0.68. Um, I'll talk a bit about the fidelities in a second. Uh, we then do some further measurements uh, on this star state, um, emulating a kind of type 1 fusion by pro projecting this qubit onto 0 and find fidelity of 0.77. Similarly, we can emulate type 2 fusion by projecting these qubits onto 0, um, and we get a fidelity of 0.83. And similarly, we can generate this state and get uh, uh, another high fidelity. And so. In this state, these photons have never seen each other. They simply have entanglement from um, the global entanglement that was once there. Uh, we also do some Merman tests, which are ba based on our stabilizers. So these are um, not like Bell tests, generalized to uh, more parties. And we find, um, so we use a, a two-setting Bell test, which um, tests, um, finds a, a Bell parameter within the state, and we find that we uh, com comfortably, comfortably uh, surpass the non-local bound, which is here too. Um, and we also use a um, three-setting Merman test, which tests the kind of global non-locality of the state. Uh, and we find that our star state violates this bound just, uh, but the line state is uh, lacking. And this is just to do with the reduced fidelity of that state. Um, <coughs> Um, so to understand um, better our fidelities and um, why, they're, why they are what they are, we um, used three different um, uh, models. So um, we suspected three different parameters causing us infidelity, the first of them being a uh, phase shift error, the second being the indistinguishability of the photons, and the third one being uh, multi-photon contamination uh, from, uh, from the sources. So sometimes you generate too many photons, and this uh, adds noise to your... Um, data. Um, so we have these three models which independently test for these um, uh, parameters, for a, for a range of parameters, um, and we then fit that data to our measured data for our star and line states, um, and we uh, then use Bayesian parameter estimation to extract the, the most likely uh, parameter for these, uh, um, uh, for these parameters. Um, we find that for the indistinguishability, the um, distributions line up fairly well with our estimates uh, from the um, unheralded D2 and also the HOMDIP. Uh, for the phase setting error, they're quite a bit higher than what we expected from the crosstalk, but there may be uh, uh, systematic uh, contributions to this too. And then for the brightness, uh, we find a kind of nominal level of brightness. So during our measurements, we uh, calibrated brightness um, and monitored it constantly. And tried to get it to be uh, around 0 0.03 or uh, around this level, and so this is sort of what we expected too, but it just kind of um, corroborates uh, our understanding of the, the sources that we, of infidelity that we know to be present and uh, links that to the fidelity of our state. Um, so a bit of fidelity, are a bit of perspective. Um, our fidelities are not that high, and uh, something I haven't really mentioned so far is the, the count rate, which is measured in millihertz. Um, so that means we, for each of these um, fidelity measurements, we were integrating for a couple of weeks of kind of solid integration time. Um, but just to kind of look around and see, see what's been done historically, the first four-photon graph state had a count rate measured in millihertz, just about. The fidelity is quite similar. 
Um, uh, but if you look at the kind of state-of-the-art GHZ state, so this 12-photon star state, uh, the fidelity is lower and the count rate is uh, uh, sub-millihertz. And so it seems like when people are pushing the technology and trying to do the, the, the biggest experiment that's available, this is the kind of regime that they're sitting in. Uh, similarly, the first line state had a, a slightly lower fidelity than us, though higher count rate, uh, although the state of the art has now much surpassed that. Um, and so you can see there's a trajectory as technology increases that fidelities and count rates will go up. And um, so in our experiment, we um, used a kind of run-of-the-mill uh, silicon photonic process with um, an essentially unoptimized uh, process and components. Uh, and our chip had a loss of about, or a source to detect a loss of about 20 dB, so 1%. Uh, and then over four photons, that's 20 dB times four, which is 80 dB on the fourfold rate. We calculate that by using state-of-the-art um, processes, so uh, propagation loss and coupler loss, that dB could be as low as about three, sorry, that, that loss could be low, as low as about three dB, uh, which would increase our fourfold rate by something like seven orders of magnitude. Um, so we'd be up at 50 million megahertz or 50,000 hertz um, if we were to combine all these technologies into one, which would enable high fidelities as seen here or um, equally uh, some photon number scaling uh, up to eight or, or so, I expect. Um, so in summary, we, we have this uh, chip. We use a reconfigurable gate to generate both types of entanglement for the first time in an, in an experiment. Um, we have good two qubit um, operation, our HOM dip is uh, um, a reasonable value at 0.8. Um, we verify that we can generate both of these classes of graph state entanglement with a reasonable fidelity. Uh, we generate some extra um, states in a kind of measurement-based kind of way, and we corroborate independent measurements of our um, infidelity parameters using Bayesian parameter estimation. Thank you very much. How are you planning to scale up to more than Hello. How are you planning to scale up to more than four photons? Um, so it should just be enabled by um, decreased loss. So if you had um, 10 dB less loss, then you could easily imagine a six photon device. And then you can start to access using the reconfigurable nature of our gate. Okay, I've got to go a long way. But you saw all those um, uh, six photon graph states. Um, you could create a single device that could generate six of those entanglement classes by, I'm not going to get there, concatenating these um, gates that are reconfigurable, uh, which is a, another distinction and advantage that integrated optics has. You can use this reconfigurable nature to do six different types of entanglement, most of which wouldn't have been, haven't been generated before. But really, it's the loss, uh, reduction in loss, that would enable that with this technology. Is there a chip? In the, uh, in the works at the moment that will address some of these lost problems? Or are there chips in the group at the moment that have already addressed <laughs> these lost problems? Um, yes, yeah, so this, the state of the art, um, uh, two, well, these, this two first one experiment I showed, which has hundreds of components, has um, um, probably a fraction of the loss of, that this chip has because they takes advantage of uh, kind of some state-of-the-art grating couplers and processing techniques from some collaborators, rather than a kind of run-of-the-mill silicon photonics foundry like we used. Um, so, yeah, there's lots more advanced tech stuff there's coming. Point, point 0.5 or point 0.6 dB loss grating couplers yes. in the group. Our, our, ours were four and a half. <laughs> so. well, already on the way. Mm. Okay, I think we'll close the conference there. We'll thank all of the speakers from today. And <laughs>